So, welcome to Football in the Blues. Um, this is episode 11. See, I'm getting good at this. I'm starting to get there and just add them up. And just for, for regular listeners, this is number two for having a female on. Amazing. Listen, I, I, I'm just, I'm proud of myself. Um, it felt like the, the kind of old man's club that were coming on and give one away about the football and drinking drugs and all that good stuff. Um, so today's guest, um, I was on LinkedIn and from a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend doing my nosy um, and I saw that, that Hannah was doing some good work um, down in Leeds. Uh, so I thought, you know, I'll reach out, see if she fancies coming on the show and just coming on for a, a chat. So... Tana, welcome to the show. Do you fancy telling everybody a wee bit about yourself? Oh, well, yeah. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me. I feel very honoured that I am <laughs> the second female that's been on. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like when you reached out to me, um, I just feel so passionately about like sharing my story. And if it inspires just one person, wherever, you know, your audience is different to audiences in other places that I talk and I do things. So um, you just never know who's listening and being inspired. So yeah, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, so yeah, I'm Hannah um, Taylor. I am the founder of Sober Butterfly Collective, which is a voluntary led uh, community. We're an alcohol-free community and we organise social meetups for like-minded people to just have alcohol-free fun. Um, we're free to join and um, yeah, nothing is off limits pretty much um, except anything with alcohol. So um, yeah, I'm also the co-founder uh, co of the Alcohol-Free Events Company. Um, so I co-founded that with um, a man called Andy Mee, who runs the Alcohol Free Drinks Company. So together, um, we organise events for people within the alcohol free uh, community. But we're also really passionate about um, putting forward the message that we're not anti-alcohol and we're pro-choice, and that we really feel that even like if people can flexi drink and people can start to cut down, that um, and we can stop sober shaming that the world would just be a bit of a better place. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of me in a nutshell. <laughs> a little bit. Um, just from, from myself, we, we Hannah and I had a chat before this and we were saying it's always football in the blues. So I said, <laughs> she said, oh, you won't get much football chat. But <laughs> I, did, I did find out a wee story. So would you mind telling everybody about that, Hannah? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so... I haven't ever been a huge like football uh, fan, but when I went to university, I moved to Manchester and um, I actually started a job um, at a sports bar, uh, which was actually back home. So I didn't live too far away from Manchester. So I started a job at a sports bar. And the day that we opened, um, I remember the electrician saying to me, you know, oh, who do you support? Like, you know, what's what's your favourite team? And I said, I didn't have one. And he said, oh, you can't work here. You can't work in a sports bar and not follow a football team. So I said, well, oh, OK. Well, you know, I live in Manchester now, so I should probably, you know, follow a Manchester team. Um, and at the time, you know, Man United were, you know, <laughs> the, the the big team so I went for the underdogs and I said oh you know I'll, I'll I'll pick City and he said oh great we'll have some banter because I'm a United fan so that'll like you know um be good um be good chat for the season so um yeah and then that was it I, I supported City for that season and uh, that was the season that they won so um <laughs> yeah it was that I actually was very emotional watching because that was it was such a tense game where you had to watch um oh, what was the other game that was going on and it was like so close. Um, yeah. so I think good. Man you I think Man you were winning it in the lead up to the I think it was yeah. the injury time. Um yeah, Manchester like City two one down at home to QPR and then obviously Aguero when he scores his goal. So yeah. there you go. So it's, no, that's yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's and now see, seeing as seeing as you're you're you seem like a lucky person, you can now switch your affiliation to Rangers and give us a wee bit of luck because we we need all the luck that we can get. If I'm yeah. being 
brutally honest. Um, that's it. You're you're in. You're sworn in, and and there's no going back. <laughs> but yeah, I will, and I will admit this. So I did do the awful thing that mo- any Manchester <laughs> fan listening to this will be like, "Oh my God, get her off." <laughs> Um, because I worked in hospitality um, while I was um, at university, I actually ended up with a job um, later into university at Old Trafford. <laughs> I worked in the- shock. Uh, so I've met, I've met, yeah, many of the team um, from back then. Um, so yeah. So did you did you admit to them where <laughs> your allegiances were? Yeah, when when you're a student, your allegiance is money. <laughs> Correct. That's a good. That's a very good point. My mum always used to say that, and it was, you, what was it? You support. Was it? It's about football teams, and it was something about supporting your, your legs, and your legs support you. Something yeah. along the bloody lines. I can't remember that saying. Jesus, minds went blank. <laughs> but, um, but oh, that's cool. It's, as I say, it's always good to get the the wee football <laughs> chats on. Yeah, I had a story. Not you. You took it. Aye, that's it. Good. <laughs> you've you've passed the first test, and now you're a, an, an ardent Rangers fan. That's you. Yeah. Good. You're sworn into the club. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so just a, a wee bit about yourself, Hannah. Um, can you just tell everybody did, when when would you say? I know you were saying you started in hospitality at a young age um what, what age was that so technically it was I was I was actually 13 so it was just before my 14th birthday um I just started a private golf club and um, so it was just at like private events um I then went through all all sorts of jobs I've worked at like little family pizzerias I've worked at um, as soon as I turned 18, I got a, I got a bar job. Like that was the goal. Like literally the day after, I think I was, I was there. Um, and yeah, as I say, went to university, worked um, at, at Old Trafford. I've worked, um, worked for events companies. I worked for warehouse projects. So if anybody sort of is from Manchester way, they will know about where project. So I worked for raves. You know, so I was just always Thanks. around alcohol from a very young age and I did the you know the typical drinking at house parties drinking on the park you know when you go to university I joined dance society and I was on the committee and I became chairwoman so I was like I was organizing all the socials and you know you get into clubs for free you get given free vodka like it's just my whole you know world was developing and more and more becoming entwined around alcohol um I went traveling after university so you know that it didn't stop then um and then when I came back after traveling um just because all my work experience had been in hospitality for so long um I ended up with a with a full-time job in like a local pub restaurant it had a few hotel rooms function rooms so it was just non-stop um and I ended up the living manager um, a little bit by accident because the managers got fired very quickly um, and I got asked to step in. And that was it, really. That was kind of like trapped, if I'm totally yeah. honest. Um, and it was just a never ending cycle. You know, there was always people to drink with, always a reason to drink. Like someone else was just always wanting you to keep that that bar open a little bit later. And it was... Yeah. It, it was it wasn't totally remote but it was quite remote and Mm -hmm. I didn't drive at the time so you know when you live in and you've only got a few stairs to go up at the end of the night you don't really have that excuse of I've got to go or I've got to be somewhere else like the the staff (laughs) the guests everybody knows well what are you gonna go go sit by yourself so um yeah that I would say those sort of like the two years that I worked there that is when my my drinking habits became a bit more problematic and unhealthy um but again you don't recognize it at the time because everyone else around you is doing it when the staff are drinking you know I didn't really have a social like a personal social life um my social life was the pub yeah so what what ages what ages were those round about Hannah so I was 24 when I got the job, so I was 24 to 26. 
quite a responsibility as well, do you know, being yeah. 24 years old and essentially the landlord of a pub. Yeah. Do you know, that's, that's quite a responsibility. I know if I, if I was left in charge of a, a pub <laughs> at 24, it, it, it would be closed by the time I was 26 because I would have drank yeah. everything. <laughs> well, this is the, the manager before me, but in fact, but the restaurant manager and the bar manager, so when we when they opened the place, they had a restaurant and a bar manager, and both of them got got let go for, for pretty much exactly that. The, the bar so, manager was in, and he was just drinking the cider after he left. We didn't go. We didn't need to order cider half as much, um, and uh, and the bar manager was like giving stuff away. So his like his way of being the manager was kind of like, you know, here's a bottle of whatever, and and was was putting things on a tab or not paying for things, and so that yeah, they got let go, and you know, trustworthy Hannah got got brought in, but it it did. You know, I already drank to an unhealthy amount. I didn't, you know, I was already over that threshold. But being there definitely, um, you know, heightened that. And, um, yeah, and it wasn't until I, so I left. I left the industry. I left that job. I tried to leave after a year and they persuaded me to stay. Uh, um, and then... Um, I ended up having a breakup, so I ended up, but again, it, it was one of those things, so I, when I first started, I had a long distance relationship with a guy that lived in Europe, and it made it really difficult, it put such a strain on that, because I worked in hospitality, um, and it was quite difficult for him to understand, kind of, you know, my way of life, and I was, I was still yeah. a very party girl, but I was a party girl at like, you know that started at like midnight <laughs> when I've been there is such a shorter amount of time um and and then I ended up uh, you know that that relationship um didn't work out and then I ended up in a relationship with somebody that I worked with because it, it they understand your days off are the same yeah. we I didn't really have any hobbies and interests all my all my hobbies and things all my free time was just spent drinking um and it, and then that breakup was kind of what led to like bursting the bubble, and I was like, I need to get out of this. Yeah. End. Like, so with the with the job that was in the pub, do you think that was more? I know you said the the relationship. Do you think that's more the a relationship like, like an acquaintance? Do you know, it's more just a a man friend that. Do you know that it's like an enabler that the two of you have got the same the same interests at heart, which is drinking and revolving round about the pub. Do you know, and maybe at a subconscious level that that played into your mind to say, do you know, this is comfortable, this is um, this is easy. Do you know, and you maybe because I, I found it myself when I when I was doing what I was doing, it was always uh, you would always settle. You would always say, listen, this is me. You get people in life that, that get comfortable and they just go, yeah, this is cool. And they just settle. Do you think that's maybe something that played into your mind? Maybe even subconsciously? <laughs> yeah, possibly subconsciously. I think like a big part of it was I spent every single day with him pretty much in work. Yeah. And I was in a relationship pre previously where I barely see him every six weeks. No. So... You know, but they were very different lives. You know, I went from a life where every time I saw the previous, like, relationship, I, I, we went somewhere in Europe. We explored. Like, that's how we, we met traveling. And, like, you know, yeah. we would go to Dublin or Amsterdam. And, like, our anniversary was we met in Paris. Like, it was all very, like, romantic and adventurous in that sense. And then, but that was really hard to sustain. Um, yes. And then. And then, yeah, I had this, like, person that, uh, then next, that was just in my every single day life. Like, you know, it was, it, it, yeah, it was just easy, I think, like you say. You know, we we managed to get our days off together. Um, so, yeah, we, we spent any time, like, after work, he, like, moved in with me. Um and it just, it just, it just was easy. Yeah, I, I won't lie. Um, so you've maybe been looking at something that's middle of the level that that everybody seems to have relationship wise. That 
you, you break each other in a bit to say, I'll see you once a week to twice a week, three times a week, and you move forward, whereas you've thought, I've got one relationship here that I never see them, um, maybe twice a year to once a month, and then you've went from being there to every day and it's 24-7, and yeah. you're in one another's pockets, and it's just bloody hard. Yeah. And I've, I've been there myself many a time, and it's... It, at the same time, you've got the, the, the warning signs are saying, run, just get out of there. But at the same time, you're going, well, I'm comfortable. Do you know, there's no hassle. I'm nice and chilled. Just keep doing what you're doing because you've you've got that. It's like, a, what is it called? Like a, a marriage of acquaintance or something, I think they cry it. Um, that's... I was definitely like thought, you know, long it was going to be long term and like, you know, you had a a child and like I'd become like the stepmom and you know it was very like I thought right okay this is it like we said you know we're settling down in that sense yeah. and, um even at that though Hannah I mean 26 25 26 it's a uh, and I, I'd listen I'd, I'd say the same to to mine as well like go and enjoy the world go and see everything that the world's got to see and just enjoy it you know you're not here for a you're not here for a long time so you may as well go and see what the world's got to offer rather than and that would probably if you, if you were my daughter that would be the advice that I would give you is just to say listen you know that you, you're moving into a, a, a ready-made family essentially you've got the you, you've got the the, the daughter oh, sorry is that a daughter yeah it was. so you've got that so you've got the, the ready-made family there that you're just stepping in Plus, you've got a lot of the, the the trouble that goes on behind the scenes when the the mother of the daughter gets that thought in her head that there's another woman on a turf, and was, that's yeah, I like, know how that goes. Extreme. I'd gone from I'd gone from that life of adventure to like the total opposite, and and that as a mindset shift was a big thing for me, um, because I actually never planned to come back from travelling. I'd moved out to Australia and didn't come, wasn't planning on coming back. But we had a family loss, and it it triggered me to come back. And like so, you know, I was going through that. You know, in your twenties, you're figuring out where you want to do, what you want to, where you want to be, and um, and I do think that that it was a big mindset shift or uh, thing to have to process and I do think that being in the pub my whole life revolving around it I just lived in a bubble essentially and my men my personal mental health like massively declined in that time I didn't get to see my friends very often because of my shifts so like I didn't necessarily see it at the time and I can obviously can look back now and just think I probably was even difficult to live with like you know that I didn't want to work in the pub anymore I didn't know my way out I didn't really know I'd kind of like lost a bit of who I was um and that's why when the breakup happened I kind of I quit with no job to go to I was like I have to get out of this industry um I have to find who I am again um and, and it did take me a little while. Um, I mean, I, I I got in fairly quickly um, into my career, which was interior design. So that's what I'd studied at university. So I did get a job um, part time doing that. Uh, but a sort of like year in um, was when I first started assessing my relationship with alcohol. I'd never even thought of it before. Like it just didn't didn't cross my mind. Um, but I. I'd got this, you know, I'd come out of hospitality. I was no longer in a relationship. I'd like moved house. I'd done all the things that, you know, you think like they're going to, that's going to make it better. That's going to make it better. That's going to make it better. And I still felt really like unhappy. Like it was like this deep unhappiness and I couldn't put my finger on it. I'd said to one of my friends, like, I think I need to go to counselling or therapy. But at the time I was drinking quite a lot. <laughs> um, you know, I'd, it was the first time in my life I'd had evenings free, weekends free. Um, and because I'd lost all of my hobbies and my friends' lives had moved on in that time, I felt like I was in a bit of a time warp and that, you know, other people had, like, moved and I... Yeah. Nothing much had changed in mine. And um, I needed to, like, 
yeah find some new hobbies and um so I actually well I figured if I went to therapy at that point I would probably just come home and sink two bottles of wine after it and just have spent 60 pounds for an hour session and just not really got anywhere so um because I was kind of like drinking to to like fill that void I suppose you know like I was getting home from work and like whoa what do I do now I would normally be starting to now (laughs) I've got all (laughs) um so yeah so that was when I kind of started my journey as we'll say and I bought a notebook and that's where it all started. So where where did the where did the epiphany come from? I mean, we we just for the, the listeners, I did say to Hannah earlier, we were talking about just things appearing and, and you seeing things a lot clearer. And it's funny because I, I love meeting people that are the same as me. I love meeting people that see these things because to somebody that, that doesn't see it you look like a maniac but you can see it I can see it and it's it's funny because when you have those conversations you go ah, I see it you see it do you know whereas I say it before there's like it's like people with blinkers on do you know it's it's a hard thing to to see it but the more you open your eyes to these things you do see these these things every day it's things will pop out to you what what would you say was your epiphany? I know you said that you had a, a, a pad and a pen and you were really unhappy. Um, but what was the penny drop moment for, listen, I'm going to get a notepad? So, um, I'm not I'm not really sure exactly what, what triggered the notepad like act, action as such, but um possibly just the conversation with my friend about therapy and I just knew that wasn't really an option and maybe I can do this you know do something myself um but it was the the sort of penny drop moment as such for me was actually physically what things that I wrote down so I just decided to write down like really like little habits I wanted to change all the way up to like big dreams in my life like I was like you know what what how can I make myself happier what what things do I think in my head will make me happier and um, I wrote pages I put different titles on them like I put like you know uh, like finance social family like all sorts of things like you know video call like friends on the other side of the world more or like go to a yoga class was one of them or like you know eventually kind of own my own house but then one of them that I had on sort of like, I don't know, the, the body um, um, uh, title that I'd put or something like that was I wanted to limit alcohol. Now, this was not the top thing. This was like way down in the list. Yeah. Um, I'd put in brackets sober October. And then when I like looked back and I reviewed all of the lists, it was that was the thing that stood out as, well, maybe if I did that one thing, and I limited alcohol, maybe I could actually do a lot more of these things on the list. So I would have more time, I would have more money, I would have more motivation, productivity, energy, just, you know, maybe just doing that one thing that I do most days (laughs) would actually allow me to do some of these other things. Um, And so, yeah, I just, I, I decided to break up with alcohol is how I saw it I kind of saw it as a little bit of a breakup in September because I did this activity at the beginning of September and I didn't stop until the 27th of September um but I'd kind of throughout that month like questioned every time I was having a drink like what is this adding to this experience this moment this like you know if I was with my mum and having a glass of wine like do I need this why am I having this is it habit is it you know, is it because I need it to relax? Is it because I'm stressed? Is it? Um, and so actually, by the time I had my last drink, I was I actually moved out of the house I was living in at the time. It coincided very well. And we sat and had a gin and tonic, me and my mum, and I didn't even finish it. I was like that done with like, this isn't adding anything to this moment. We just think we should do this right now because it's a celebration. I'm moving out. So why why do you think why do you think that is? I mean, 
I've said it before. I, I was in was in Spain with the boys months ago, and it was maybe four, just over four years um, since I had a drink. And the boys were saying, "Have a drink, Craig. Have a drink. Have a drink." My conscience was telling me, "Don't you go, Craig. Have a few." And I did say to one of my friends that if we won that title, then I would have had a glass of champagne to celebrate. And the minute I said it, I thought. That's just stupidity. And he called me on it, which was good. Um, but again, why why do you think that we say these things to each other? Why is it you you'd said before um, when we were talking about the unlucky designated drivers? Um wh- yeah. why do you think it's like that? It's just just so entwined into our society. Like we we celebrate, we commiserate, we like everything that we do, we involve alcohol for some reason. Um, like you know, I I know from from my like you know from my life, like any chance I got to have a drink, I I would want it. You know, no yeah. matter what day, go to the pub quiz on a Wednesday with one of my friends, she would have a cook, and I would be like, great, I'm gonna have a, like a large glass of wine, mm. um, and it's. It's just, yeah. My, my the only or the only answer from in my perspective is just it's just so entwined. It's so marketed. I mean, we spoke briefly like before, like it's marketed to us in on ev- for every occasion at at every possible point that that they can market it to us. You know, yeah. if women didn't used to drink as such in the way that you know the Ladette culture grew and and then oh. now the beyond that has become the like pink you know that everything's become pink like pink gin and like i mean gin it's targeted yeah u- unicorn tears or boyfriend tears or i've seen all sorts of crazy like <laughs> it's just gin. it's just packaging making this like it's... look like oh there's i should have it for that reason or i should um, you know, bottomless brunches is something I always give an example of. Like that is a glamorized ninety minute challenge. Like that is how much can you drink in ninety minutes? That's all anybody cares about. Like you book that, however much you pay for it, and you're like, yeah. I, I need to get my money's worth. We all know how much a bottle of something costs or a beer costs. So you want to make sure that you can drink more than that money that you spent on it. <laughs> And I've done it myself. I've done it so many times. And, you know, we used to go out at like two o'clock in the afternoon and I wouldn't get home till four in the morning from a 90 minute, 90 minute brunch. So, yeah, it's just. It's the joys. We we used. Come we, we used to we used to do the exact same, and it was uh, all you could drink um, and all you could eat buffet. There was somewhere up in Partick, just outside of Glasgow, and that was the same. I, I was drinking pints of beer, and then I thought, you know what, vodka, that's the way to go. <laughs> and I had the big guy beside me, and he's going vodka, 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 and I'm. And that was me. I was absolutely pissed. <laughs> and I think it was the same. I think it was a night, like essentially a 90 minute challenge. And it was, do you know, I'm Craig, I'm going for this. And uh, I'd be lucky if I can remember anything about that night, to be honest. And it's so many nights that you lose. Yeah. I mean, I used to, so I used to go out underage into clubs in Halifax. And like we, used to there used to be a club that you could pay 10 pounds in you'd get a wristband and you could drink anything off this specific like list so it was obviously your alka pops it was archers it was malibu it was cheap vodka it was like the real like you know but you would literally pay 10 pounds in and that was it so you needed enough to get into the club pay taxi home and a takeaway Where, where whereabouts is this club just <laughs> say, um, for future um, reference right but it's closed but we have another place in Halifax this is still going this has been going since like my aunties and beyond before that we're going out um the 75p a drink we used to go in for what we called power hour 
So we would go to a pub beforehand. Then we would go at nine o'clock to this club for an hour, drink as much as you possibly could in that time. And then we would go on to a club. It's <laughs> crazy. And uh, that, that there's generations that have grown up with, with you know, problems and binge drinking and like, because it, it was a lot more, well, it was a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible than probably it is now, you know, bottomless brunches are a lot more expensive, aren't they, nowadays? You know? it's, do you think, like, I mean, I, I, I say it myself, I think it's getting, it's getting really dangerous for, for, for women nowadays being out, and don't get me wrong, it's, it's dangerous for, for men as well, um, especially with, with people getting spiked. Um, I, I remember my cousin telling me a story about there was some friends that she met in Malia, I think it was, and they came over here, um, it was a, a big gay guy from London, and they went out on a night out in Glasgow, and seemingly he, he got his, his drink spiked, and it just, it's it's just so, it's so bloody dangerous now, um, and I think with, with things being that available, so easy, uh, so readily accessible, it's... It's, it puts the fear of God into me as a, as a dad. You just, it, I, I couldn't bear thinking about it. Do you know, it just seems like it's more dangerous in Britain than it's ever been. Um, did you ever have any experiences like that, Hannah? Was there anything that, that do you know are from your friends? Well, I, I would say as a group of friends, we were quite lucky um, that nothing... You know, we were more just a danger ourselves, if I'm honest. <laughs> like, you know... Um, but there was nothing, you know, too, too horrific that ever really particularly happened. But then, like, when you take, like, so it looked like what we were saying before, like, when you take the blinkers off and when you remove that, like, and, and you're sober and you're the sober one in the group, you think, how many dangerous situations we've got into? Like, when we let our friends just walk off, like, find their own way home, like, I am often the driver now and not because like you know oh, Hannah's the designated driver I want my friends to get home they will be like oh no no it's fine like I'll go I'll get a taxi and then they're like 10 minutes up the road and I'm like I would much rather make sure I get you home like yeah. myself um I you know that that time I just mentioned when I went out in two in the afternoon till four in the morning I wandered off and I went and disappeared and my friends didn't know where I was like you know often girls do do that um and it's I'm just very fortunate I've never ended up in such a dangerous situation however saying that now that I've just been saying that I do remember a time um I don't know if I was about 18 um I got a taxi home uh, by myself and uh, the taxi driver actually locked me in and I freaked out couldn't get out it's got started going a different way um it's a bit of a blur what 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 actually happened next but all I remember was I think I'd like taken my shoe off to like threaten to hit him um and then all I remember next was I was out of the taxi and I sat on a wall outside a petrol station absolutely crying my eyes out um i don't mm. think i had battery on my phone um and it was it was pretty much daylight by this point so um this um this little old man like drove up parked up near me sat on this wall and was just like checking i was okay get got out and um i was i don't know freezing i was probably just a mess and mm. He offered to take me home. Now, why I thought it was a really good idea to have got out of a taxi and then into another st strange man's car, but I just felt, I guess I just felt yeah. safe or I just wanted to get home. Who knows what was going through my mind at the time, but he did genuinely take me home and my mum was obviously very grateful. Um, but but that story could not have ended like that. That story could very much, very easily have ended in a very different way. Um, my mum will probably be well. My mum obviously knows about this, but yeah, <laughs> she she was on the receiving end of this story. But you know that, and and oftentimes my mum would actually come and pick me up in the middle of the night from certain times, like from certain nights out. And I think because I was scared for a long time of getting in a taxi, 
Um, so yeah, that's that's my my only real horror story that I kind of ever had. But but it could have been worse. Yeah, I've got that. I, I could tell you a million and one scare stories um, from myself and for taxis as well. Like I, I can I can remember I was getting a taxi from Glasgow Central. And there was girls jumped in a taxi. Uh, they left their, they left one of their friends on the bench, and she'd obviously been sick. And there was a, a team of young boys um, just staring her up and down. And I ended up, I, I took the lassie, put the girl in a taxi, and took her to like Dumbarton to her house. Made sure she get in her house, and got the taxi back. So it's like the other end of the city to like the the northeast to the south um southwest and I went, I went back home and the taxi driver gave me a, gave me it for nothing just because it was i'd seen that kind of danger so luckily enough i wasn't mm. too drunk but yeah. i'd noticed that and i took the girl home made sure she got in the house okay and then back down the taxi driver took me home but so so many boys and girls that are just unlucky with that stuff yeah. that, putting yourself into danger ah, you know you you're making yourself more vulnerable you know you it's um yeah i mean we see stuff on the news all the time don't we and and yeah. it's it's just one of my friends um the other day like used this analogy of like russian roulette like she that was referring yeah. Her, like drinking and what could happen when she drank but I was just like well that is just the case for anything that is what what you're doing when you binge drink like I was a regular blackout drinker I, I would piece my night together from my f- photo album on my phone you know <laughs> where I was I'm, like and and my friends filling me in on other stories and kind of a big part of what um when I got introduced to the sober community um that was because I um, an article got shared in my friend's group chat um from someone who was hung over who'd read this article from uni lad or lad bible and um it was about anxiety and yeah. that so talking of like light bulb moments and pin drops like that for me was the moment of like I never really got hangovers mm-hmm. um but when I read about anxiety, I was like, oh, my gosh, it's like reading my life, like, like reading, like, yeah. a week. Um, and then that was how I got introduced to Millie Gooch, who started Sober Girl Society, and I started following her on Instagram. And once you open that, like, little door into the sober community, it's just like your whole, you just go that down this rabbit hole. Um, yeah. I started following loads of others. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I did sober October Um, and I actually found it surprisingly a lot easier than I thought I would and I think partly because of what I spoke about before the breakup with alcohol in the September like I'd kind of questioned it but then um, I said to my friends like make sure you still include me you still invite me like I it's it's up to me if I don't want to drink it's up to me how long I stay out like don't exclude me essentially like I'm still going to be the little social butterfly that everybody knows me as um or well that was my intention but I was obviously terrified of like can I even be that person without yeah. alcohol? um but I kind of really wanted it and um so I booked to go to one of Millie's uh, she did a bottomless boozeless brunch in Manchester the one-off because she's based down south and I went to that and honestly that that like connection and community feeling of walking into that room which don't get me wrong was terrifying you know <laughs> want to change your relationship for whatever reason is is scary um but I just suddenly felt like these are my people these people understand they're gonna get it I can share I can be vulnerable I can be honest and yeah. um and I think that's why, like, anybody who looks at their relationship with alcohol immediately wants to help or share, you know, like, why I came on the podcast, like, why I've why I've got to the point I have with starting Sober Butterfly and with the events company is because you, I've just been really open to making connections, not just with people drunk in the toilet that I'm never going to see again. <laughs> 
I, th- I think that's I think that's a big part of it. Um, it's like even even for myself, just that's as I say, that's four and a half years um, since I've had a drink, and it's you, you do you see things a lot clearer. Um, you you see better opportunities, and and again, I'm glad that you've done what you've done because it, it shows people that there is life without it. Do you know, I always looked at it was a night out was hand in hand with the with the drink, and it, it couldn't be farther from the truth. It's it's good, and that's kind of why I was speaking to yourself about it because it's important to see people making. Oh, my lights went off. Um, it's important to have people make those decisions to say, do you know that alcohol isn't everything? I'm going to make that change in my life and just. Cut it out. Do you yeah. know you you really you really don't need it. Do you no. know nobody needs it. I didn't know a single person. I was twenty seven when I stopped. I didn't know a single person that just didn't drink out of, like choice, really. Like, um, and so they're finding sober girl society, and then it inspiring me to organize meetups near Leeds. Um, you know that's how I started. I just started looking on Instagram and um put a, a post out sort of looking for people around the area that would be interested in alcohol free meetup and my phone went my phone went crazy. Like it was just like people really wanted that and really craved that and I started, you know, Sober Butterfly by accident. I didn't set out with, oh I'm gonna start this national community that's gonna help people across the country. I just said I just want to find some friends in Leeds that I can go to brunch with that doesn't involve alcohol and yeah. it that just caught on and um I mean it was just before COVID that this all happened as well um because I'm like yeah, three and a half years sober now so it was just before COVID and so then during COVID was when you know a lot of people for whatever reason their relationships with alcohol changed whether it meant they were just a social drinker before and then now they were drinking at home because we were all sat on Zoom doing quizzes and <laughs> socialising through a screen. Um, our people were drinking alone because they were alone. And um, just that that big shift during that time has meant like a lot more people have like looked at their relationship with alcohol. And by the time we came out of lockdown, Sober Butterfly had gone from an Instagram group chat to a page with thousands of followers. Our first meetup we did in Yorkshire I had people from Essex, Newcastle, Birmingham, uh, Manchester, Lancashire come because they wanted that like connection with people in real life uh, to to just feel I mean there's a I can never remember who said it but the quote that's um, connection is the opposite um, of addiction Um, you know if we can find that that's you know why AA works for people it's why communities like what I've set up work for people because they just don't want to feel alone um do you think that obviously we we spoke about it before um alcohol alcohol is a big thing in the the midlands it's a big thing in the north it's a big thing in scotland um I don't know any cultures that drink like the Scots if I'm being brutally honest I mean that anytime I was going to the Shetlands you would see people drinking at seven in the morning you know going on holidays and we've just got this toxic culture um, do you think that's something that that would take off in Glasgow have you got any put it this way have you got any plans to expand kind of north uh, of the yeah, border really, yes so I've had a couple of, of inquiries about um, going up into Scotland, yeah. Um, we're just we're in the process of kind of it could, because it's just been voluntary. Well, it is voluntary led. It will always be voluntary led. So my yeah. my like mantra for Sober Butterfly is friendship is free, and you know, don't get me wrong. If we're going for a coffee, you've got to pay for your coffee. You know, <laughs> you're going to a yoga class, you've got to pay for a yoga class. But but like, there's no membership fee, and um, I, I, so I. I set, when I kind of quickly realised when we came out of lockdown that there, this could expand and people wanted it and they they were com- they were travelling really far 
like for the first few months to come to meetups and I was like I can't physically go to all these places how do we sustain this like and grow it um so I started um something called curious coffee catch-ups so we do that on the second Saturday of um the month um so no matter what if somebody wants to start what we call a flutter so a group is a flutter um you know people can um and they have to just you know we start our sun yeah it's our signature meetup I suppose um and we do it on the same day at the same time so that no matter if there's only two people for example so we've got a group in Scarborough and there's only a couple of them and often only two of them can do it on the same day um you know two of them might meet in Scarborough but 30 of us might meet in Leeds because we've been going a lot longer however they all feel wherever they are they feel connected so yeah. we've got what we call butterfly buddies who facilitate these like meetups and help these groups grow so um yeah if anybody's listening and wants to become a volunteer butterfly and be a butterfly buddy um and start a group um that's that's essentially how we grow it because that's right back to the roots of of how I started it I was one person who was looking for friends I started a group chat and my first ever meetup was a coffee um meetup and it's grown from there and I'm you know that that doesn't cost anything to join as such so it's not a membership it's just you know come along um a, a big reason why we the way it's set up as well is it's very casual because I know and especially you know from experience within what we've done people social anxiety takes over yeah especially going to meet strangers especially going to kind of talk about a topic that we all feel a little bit you know like we want to hold but it feels a big step to go and talk to anybody um about your your drinking habits no matter um where you sort of are on the on the spectrum of that um so yeah it's not something you have to like pay for to book or anything like that you just have to let us know you come in um keep it all a little bit underground um as in all the like where we where we host it you've got to be in the groups to know that yeah. so host it like publicly online and, and things like that. if if you need um if you need any help just let me know um i'm sure if, if listen if anybody wants to to get in touch with myself um or, or hannah just regarding it just send me a message or, or send hannah a message it's not a problem um i'm sure we could try and start something in scotland um i don't know i don't <laughs> know if i could run a cake's butterfly group but <laughs> hey ho you never know <laughs> Uh, um you know we're very inclusive um if it is predominantly being women up to now just because I think naturally I'm a woman and who it's attracted on Instagram has been more female um you see the reason we called sober butterfly is it it's a play on being a social butterfly you know yeah. the transformation that you go through see yeah I, I, I got it see yeah <laughs> not just not just a heart rack sure <laughs> It's, it's kind of a bit of a symbol for like the transformation that the butterflies you know go through so we call people who are just curious because it's open to anybody like if you still drink but you're kind of like interested in like what a sober lifestyle would be like you know all we ask is somebody doesn't come hungover you know if you drank the night before, really it, it would be triggering for people but um you know, I think if if anybody's brave enough to come to something like that, you know, early on, I wouldn't be where I am now had I not gone to a meet up when I was six weeks in and then yeah. felt, oh, actually, I'm not sure this is just a thing about limiting alcohol anymore. I think this is actually something I need to do long term. And, you know, I I say never say never still. People ask me now. Um but I don't know what's around the corner. Um, I would love to think that I won't, um, but I just don't know. I mean, starting a, a community and starting an events company that's based around it keeps me pretty accountable. <laughs> but, that's, but that's the good thing as well. It's like, I, I've said it many a times that I could easily fall off the wagon. Do you know, I'm, I'm in too many situations in Glasgow that 
everything revolves around drink. Absolutely bloody everything. And it's, you know, even working away from home just now, easy enough to, to go and get a carry out. Nobody would know, you know, but at the same time, I, I feel as if I've got a duty to the, the silent people out there that, that are suffering. And you're the exact same. It's And as I say, it's, it's refreshing to meet people that think like that. Do you know, you feel a sense of responsibility. Yeah, I mean, and, you started a podcast. You know, if you, you could be down the pub sinking pints, but instead, you know, you're recording podcasts and you're trying to help people and you're raising that awareness and you're putting other people's voices out there and you're thinking, well, if I can get this guest on and somebody can hear this story, it might help somebody. You know, my my. Yeah. Favorite my first month of not drinking I listened to a, um, a podcast about sobriety every single day um, for that month and I listened to you know what 30 odd different stories um, uh, from people and so you know, not everybody initially you think you're going to relate to like you know me coming on a football and blues podcast I was like oh not sure you know but yeah I'll come share my story because I don't know who's going to be listening to this and um sure. People look for, well, you should look, listeners, for the similarities and not the differences. Um, you know, you should always be able to go away and think there's something in someone's story that's relatable, no matter how, you know, it could not be even about my drinking. It, it could just be something completely different. But, um, yeah, you, you just you just never know. But it's, it's like as as you said there, it's it's not about the don't look for those differences. Just see if there is any similarities. Because the the reason I started doing this was because I know there's so many people, the length and breadth of Britain, that do the same things that I do, that do the same things that you do. And if if somebody's sitting on a Sunday, and this pops up on Instagram, and they go. Oh, there's Craig. What's, what's Craig up to? And they have a wee look and they go, do you know, that's me. That That's exactly what I'm doing just now. I'm sitting on the couch. I'm waiting on the Chinese to open. I never ever finish it. I, I, I drink three or four beers on a Sunday to, to bloody keep the fear away or the anxiety as you cry it. And it's like, there's so many people in Britain that do the exact same stuff. And if they can see that... I, I'm open about it. If you're open about it, then maybe we can make a change. Yeah. Do you know? And we've got to look at it in the the positive to say, let's go for it. Do you yeah. know? Let's try and make the change. I since I was more, a little bit more vocal, but I mean, I don't like preach. I don't push it on people. I don't. I'm, say, you know, I'm I'm de- I'm not anti-alcohol. I am pro choice. I just think people should know that there is another option that you can live a life without alcohol that you can still socialize you can still go out I mean there was 12 of us that went um out the other week in Leeds to the Hacienda um event now obviously that's notorious for you know yeah and drugs and and whatever else and there was 12 of us that went that didn't drink and it was like the amount of like people who came over to us and were like, God, you guys look like you're having so much fun. Like there's the, like our energy was just like radiating. And yeah. we would say like, oh, no, we, you know, we haven't had anything. And they'd be so surprised. And like there was, I mean, Andy, my business partner so in the, uh, the events company. So he's 60, right? He came out with us he is like it's like he's been given a like almost like a second chance at life like he's and he is fully like taking it he um he came with us to hacienda because it's a, it's music he absolutely loves um and he actually stood in one spot all day on this like little platform he had a top that said sober on it and he just danced right non-stop and the amount of people that went up to him and were like you know it's incredible to watch you up there like just having the time of your life like some girls went up to him and said like we we were really like anxious to sort of like dance and then we saw you up there dancing and do it like what are we worried about and you know there was a guy who went up and had a really long chat with him about you know about his sobriety and his story and was just like I just want to I just want to know and it people are curious like people are 
they but a lot of people don't know where to go don't know where to reach out and yeah there, there is a massive stigma attached to to alcohol and asking for help with alcohol because all we kind of feel we know is like AA and people don't identify sometimes as that as that I didn't I wouldn't have gone to AA um and so having these like other like communities or podcasts to listen to or books yeah. to where you can learn in your own time and kind of go oh actually yeah maybe I do drink a bit too much maybe I do you know maybe I could you know I think moderation depending on who you are is is a tricky one and is a you know it was it wouldn't be for me um but like flexi drinking has become like quite a a big thing now you know people who want to like drink less during the week like so want to try these alcohol free alternatives and um <laughs> the lights off again mm. <laughs> um uh yeah that i think like we we're not asking people to go to everybody to to go down the sobriety route but just to show them like there is another life like you can live life in hd you know you can you hear that saying of sobriety is boring it just couldn't be further from the truth like what is boring is repeating the same thing every single weekend spending your day on the sofa um yeah. and and just just living in that in that cycle like my weekends now I couldn't tell you something that I do like regularly like every single weekend is different um and so to me that's like far from boring <laughs> No, hundred percent. Um, well, listen, uh, amazing story. I think I, I, I alluded to it earlier on, and I think that the the importance of it is is for people to listen to this and say, like, Craig doesn't look like he's got a drink problem. Hannah doesn't look like she's got a drink problem. Other guys like Scott and Robert that have been on the podcast, they don't look like they've got problems. I think it's trying to generalise the I mean you mentioned it yourself Hannah about AA I never went to AA myself because I don't I I didn't feel that it suited me but I don't know if that's the stigma that surrounds AA that were like pissy pensioners on a a park bench do you know that's I don't know why you get that thought Um, but I've got my ways of dealing with things you've got your ways of dealing with things and that's the important thing for me is to show people that that there is you're doing great things with the with what you're doing. I'm doing good things, and we're just if if somebody might not take an idea off me, they might take an idea off you, and they might join your club. And maybe I'll be there with a butterfly costume on, <laughs> just inviting people in for mocktails and all that good stuff. I think I'd be a great host. I'd look good as a butterfly. I'm. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna throw oh, we, it there. Yeah. <laughs> right, if we do, we have more and more guys, and you know, I'm actually speaking to one this week about, um, you know, he was like, how can we, you know, attract more guys into it? Because once you come to a meetup and you realise, yeah, we are super inclusive, um, you know, whether it's the name that puts people off, but that's staying because of the connotations of being social. Oh. But you know, we're, um, but yeah, it's it's absolutely, it's just a friendship group, and it's just um just a way to feel like you belong somewhere as well I think that's that's a real like big thing that I've found for you you make friends as an adult how do you make friends if you're not making them in the pub yeah and see see in all honesty like what what you're doing is beautiful you're doing something for the good of I don't even know if you can you see mankind anymore I don't know it, but <laughs> you, you know where I'm coming from. It's you're you're doing you're doing a good thing for society the same way that I'm trying to do something good for my karma as well. And do you know it's like getting people to talk, it's getting people out of the house, it's it's trying to see what we can do with society just now and how do we bring people back out of their shells, do yeah. you know? It's how how do we how do we beat this stigma and how do we beat it together? Um, but listen, you've got a you've got a new butterfly. <laughs> I'm, 
amazing. Take, take the butterfly. Well, just just um, before we go, just how would people contact um, the Sober Butterfly? How would they get in touch with you? Yeah, so our main platform is we're on Instagram. Uh, so it's at Sober Butterfly Collective. Um, we do have a website. It's always been more of a blog that we've never really known. We, we knew we had to have a presence and a website, but we didn't. It, we made it when we didn't know what we were. Um, so I'm currently going through um, the process of... Um, you know redesigning that but yeah we do have a website um if anybody ever wants to like email uh, directly we have it's hello at sober butterfly collective.com um and then i didn't really like talk about it too much but i think like you should definitely have my um business partner Andy on and he would talk about all the events and the drinks side of things but the yeah. um the events company that we've got um, is on Instagram and it's called Bold AF Events. So the reason it's called Bold yeah. is because we think that that's how people should feel about, you know, not drinking. We shouldn't be shamed. We should feel like we can boldly go up to a bar and ask for an alcohol-free drink and not be shamed into, you know, there should be choice. He, Yeah, if he comes on, he will share all of this, which is why I kind of didn't talk about it too much. But... Um, that's the, the 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 we do tasting nights together so we we do them in various like cities and with various groups so we we come and we can um you know you'll get a chance to taste all the amazing like alcohol free drinks that are out there because we know that it's people's has people hesitate to spend the money um yeah. on alcohol free <clears throat> you don't know what they're going to taste like um but yeah, if you want to try some, his website is the Alcohol Free Drinks Company. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> give it a try, and I think um, and listen, I'm gonna be coming down to Leeds. I need to try this. Um, I need to come into the the group. I'm gonna get myself a wee butterfly costume. Um, oh, love it. That's me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna join the club. But yeah. um, well, listen, we're Hannah, um, wait, wait, same pal, sorry. Sorry, I said we're going to be doing um, another beer festival at some point as well. So we did a beer festival in January. So I think you'll have to come down for that. We'll give you one one hundred percent. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> just just send me the invite. Just yeah. is it, see, see as long as I get out for the day, I'm like a I'm like a bloody caged animal. Do you know? And, and we we me not drinking anymore. I need I need something to keep me going. Do you know? I'm yeah. getting old. My life's getting a bit boring. Do you know, I need I need things to I need things to cheer me up a wee bit. Yeah. Do you know? But that sounds right up my street, and I'm definitely definitely up for that. That sounds cool. Um, so listen, thanks for coming on. Listen, thanks you've been much. a good great guest, and I think, as I say, the more people that 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 kind of warm to your side, and the more people that warm to my side, then the better. Do you know? I always look to try and get different people's perspectives whether it's someone of the the opposite sex or whether it's somebody that that that's totally different to me i'm trying to get everybody in for a chat do you know and your story is excellent and i'm sure it will resonate with plenty of people do you know and again share the podcast if you think it will help anybody i'll share the same you can you can look through the the previous ones as well if if you want for a for a look um if I'm speaking to other Glaswegians, I do speak a lot faster. I know that's I know that sounds impossible, but it's true. Uh, and it does get a bit more slang and more swear words and all that stuff. But it's not my intention. Um, but listen, I'll let you crack on and have a cracking day. And I'm, yeah. I'll keep I'll keep in touch anyway. And if you need anything, if you need any any promotional work. Just, just give me a shout because I've got lots of followers down south as well and may as well work together for the yeah. greater good. Thanks for, um, yeah, thanks for that and reaching out. And I always say, you know, you just never know where connections take you. And I, everyone that I've trusted so far since um, being sober has led to, you know, something pretty, pretty amazing. And um, yeah, so you just never know where this will go. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks for your time. Cheers, Hannah.